Good evening, ladies. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If I could have your attention. Um, we're just excited. We have some new faces tonight, too. So, shh. Uh, shh. Somebody's shushing. So, we welcome um, new faces and to be studying the book of Hebrews together. As you can see, we're going to learn all about Jesus being greater than. Um, the opening of Hebrews in my NASB Bible says, God's final word in his son. And I just think about how important the final word is from God. And it's fulfilled in his son. And if you saw the Instagram post, it's, you know, how to find encouragement to hang on to our faith during these times. So we're so looking forward. We're glad you're here. A couple of announcements. Um, we do have for you this time again a, um, the Bible journal of the book of Hebrews, and it's in the ESV translation, which is the translation that Karen will be teaching from, so you make sure and get one of these if you haven't yet. Um, Connie, will, just hold your hand up, and Connie will pass them out. Um, wanted to tell you that um, after the group teaching, we break into our small groups if you're new, and so if I could get the table leaders to just stand. So Connie Perkis, Camilla Dyer, Dyer, Dyer. Dyer. <laughs> um, Sharon Head, and Becky Pankerton. So they will just grab a table, and there's no assigned seating. Just gravitate to a table, but try to gravitate equally. <laughs> <laughs> Spread out so we don't have 25 people at one and two at another. Um, but feel free to go where you are. And also, if you have questions during the Book of Hebrews study, which you, we all will, that's okay. So we're just going to try to answer questions, but more than that, we're going to seek God. So let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Did I say everything I said? Yeah, I think that, I think that was it. <laughs> um, making sure. Heavenly Father, we bow before you with gratitude, and thank you for this opportunity to gather together, um, to seek you, to learn of you. And so we ask that you prepare our hearts now to, to hear, to receive, and to respond. And Lord, um, we pray for our sister Karen, that you would just empower her and use her mightily. So we love you, God, and we thank you for all that you have in store for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. You ready? Okay. So... If you've ever read the Gospels or ever, like, darken the doorway of a church, you know that the Gospels pretty much end at the same place, right? Resurrection of Jesus. And if you were here last spring and went through the book of Mark with us, you saw that that's exactly where we landed. It was the resurrection of Jesus. And when I was deciding what to teach after Mark, I landed with this question in my head. Jesus rose from the dead. So what? So what? I mean, because we need to answer that question. A lot of us do, because we know that we trusted Jesus for our salvation way back there somewhere, and we know we can trust him to, to uh, take us to heaven out here. But what about all this in between? What about all this in between? Because um, a lot of us have things that we are struggle with. A lot of us have uh, things we just can't get over, and we wrestle with all of our lives and the subtle message sometimes we get from teachers and from church and all kinds of things is just try a little bit harder. Just work a little bit better. Just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it, and then everything will be all better. But that's not even the gospel, okay? That's not the gospel because God doesn't ever tell us to work harder. What He, um, he says, yield more. That's what he says, and while change does require for it to stick a lot of effort on our part, we need to obey, and we need to submit, and we need to work through a lot of things sometimes. The process never starts or ends with us, ever, ever. <laughs> and that's exactly what we're going to find when we get all the way over to the end of Hebrews chapter 12, that Jesus is the author, that is the beginning of our faith, and he is also the finisher of our faith. That means he's the culmination of it. So what we need to do is not try harder. We need to see better, and that is get a fresh vision of who Jesus is. And um, to do that, once we do that, the rest of it kind of takes care of itself 
to a large degree. So this year, as we dive into the book of Hebrews, I hope my hope is that it will refine our vision by looking at what is revealed in this book about the supremacy of Jesus. And if you will remember from your elementary uh, math, this is a greater than sign. And what I used to tell my kids that the way you know which way it goes is by the little side always points to that which is smaller. And so for us in this study and for all of our life, what we need to learn is that Jesus is on the big side of the symbol. He's always on this side. And no matter how, whatever you face in your life, no matter how big it seems, no matter how complicated it seems, no matter how overwhelming it seems, everything else goes on the other side of that symbol. He simply is greater than. And so uh, the Hebrews is definitely a New Testament book. I think it is in, unique in that it's kind of a really great bridge between the two Testaments. It really does a fantastic job of pulling them both together and giving us a singular story uh, uh, of, of the whole of the Bible. In fact, there are 82 t references to the Old Testament in, uh, in Hebrews, 29 quotes, and 53 allusions. And so we're, uh, so we're going to have to do some work. We're going to have to flip back and forth. We're going to have to look at some things that maybe we're not familiar with. Um, and I, I'm going to send you an email every week uh, through the church, and you'll see at the bottom of the questions here that there's some other references besides what the passage we're going to study in Hebrews that go along with the passage we're going to talk about. So if you have time, it's really going to help you if you get out your big paper Bible and you flip it over and you read what's in Psalms, you read what's in Samuel, you read what's in Deuteronomy or whatever it is, and it's going to help you. Now, it's a tiny little bit of homework. Um, if you can't do it, that's okay. You'll still understand it. We'll talk about it in class and at your tables, but it will help you if you do that. And like uh, Sandy said, I'm going to be teaching from the English Standard, Standard for the first time, and that matches what you have in your hand, so that's going to help too. And um, I'm going to tell you right up front that this, this study is going to require something of you because this is not... A story or history or poetry. Um, this is a letter, letter of exhortation and of correction, and I don't want to make you nervous about it, but I do want to encourage you to stretch a little bit as we go along in this, to dig in it and to strive to understand. I will go verse by verse, and I'm going to do my best to give you a summary. We'll get to passages, and I'll go, okay, here's the takeaway. Here's a sentence. So I'm going to try to do that for you. I'm going to give you some application at the end, but some of these concepts need to work, be worked at. And there's a couple of, couple of three passages in Hebrews that uh, the church doesn't agree about. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to figure it out in here, but I'm going to do my best to explain those things to you as, um, as much as I can. But remember now, the deep things of God, not on the bottom shelf. It's not walk up, we just pick it up off the ground. There's some things in the Bible that we need to stretch for. We need to strain for. Uh, but remember that the Holy Spirit is your teacher. And these are His words. And so there's nobody better to teach you than Him. So just pray. And, and if you don't understand something, don't give up. Don't quit coming. Don't just say, I can't understand that. Pick up what you can understand and then begin to apply that. And he will lead you into deeper things. Now, as, before we jump into our verses for today, just a little bit of background because you really need to know who he's writing to and why he wrote this letter for you to understand these more complex things that we'll get to later. And first, we're going to look at the author. And this is so funny. Anytime I talk about, uh, we're going to go through the book of Hebrews, the first thing people want to say is, well, who do you think wrote the book? <laughs> I had that question over and over again, but nobody knows who wrote Hebrews. A lot of people want to say maybe it was Paul, but that would mean that this was the only letter that he did not self-identify at the beginning. Also doesn't sound a whole lot the way Paul wrote. Um, and some people say maybe it was Peter or Luke or Apollos. Some people say Barnabas, um, and a lot of people want to lean to that one because he was a Levite, and he would have had special knowledge and understanding of the Old Testament and the rituals and the sacrifices, but there's really not good evidence for any of them, and so we just have to leave that with God. If he had wanted us to know who wrote it, he would have told us, and um, we'll just leave it at that. And so 
Next is, is the date written, and we know for sure that it was before 70 AD. That's because this book talks a lot about the sacrifices as if they were still ongoing, as if the temple was still functioning. And the, the temple was so key to this group of people that had it been destroyed while he was writing this letter, he'd have certainly mentioned it. A lot of persecution going on. So we can probably back that date up a little bit to say it's about probably 30 or so years after the resurrection of Jesus and the, the establishment of the church. And then the recipients who got this letter, we know for sure, we don't know exactly where they were, but we do know that they were Hebrew Christians and they are believers who are deeply rooted in the Jewish heritage. They know the law, they know the customs, they know the sacrificial systems, they know about Moses, about Exodus, and all of that stuff because he references this completely on and on and on through the book. And now you have to keep in mind, and this is really important, that the, these were Christians who were once Jews. And uh, their conversion has brought about a lot of heat from their Jewish brethren. They don't like them uh, do, uh, jettisoning the whole Old Testament stuff and the rituals and everything. And so they were tempted to drift back toward the sacrificial system and all the stuff going on in the temple with an, an attitude of, well, maybe having Jesus and the Old Testament stuff, all the, the stuff in the temple, maybe it's okay. What's the big deal anyway? God gave us this system. Why, why does it matter? And that's kind of the thinking they had as they uh, drifted back toward going back to the temple, bringing sacrifices, doing, uh, uh, you know, looking at all the rituals and everything, and they had been reverting back to these Jewish customs. So that's who it was written to. And then the intended purpose was he's trying to teach them that Christ is superior and the new covenant is superior to anything in the Old Testament, that this, all of that was a shadow this, and he is the reality. And so if you remember our greater than sign, Jesus is on this side. All of the Old Testament stuff, all the stuff from, from the law and the prophets is over there less than who Jesus was. Now, again, this body of believers, they had the truth and they had begun to drift. Suffering had especially had caused them to move away from their devotion to Christ back to the external rituals of the law. And you might be thinking right here at the beginning, well, that doesn't relate to me. I'm not going to go back to any sacrificial system. What's the point of this book? Now, <laughs> it really does apply to us because this happens all the time in the church that we begin to drift back to other things to add to our relationship to Jesus. Now, we don't go back to a sacrificial system like they did, but we do move away from freedom and into legalism and trying to find out what the rules are. And that we, we leave embracing the liberty that God has given us and his followers, and we start looking for rules. Like we ask questions like, is it okay if I watch an R-rated movie? Okay, if I'm tithing, do I do it on the gross or do I do it on the net? Okay. That song over there, I don't think you can really worship God to that. And we start looking for these all external rules that make us feel better, and we start using it to judge other people. And we look to justify our behaviors and major on all this stuff on the ex outside, on the externals. And just like the early church here, we move away from Christ, kind of looking for something to add to our relationship to make it just a little bit better. So I want you to caution you right here at the beginning, uh, not just to see this in a historical setting, not to see it uh, uh, as something that those people did, but it was preserved for us so we can avoid their mistakes and embrace fully the reality of the supremacy of Christ. Because there's nothing better than him. There's nothing that makes you acceptable to God but him. There's nothing you need other than him in your relationship to God. So let's get started in our study. We're only going to look at three, the first three verses tonight because they are like 
the thesis statement over the top of this whole letter. Everything else we're going to read from now all the way around to May, everything we're going to look at comes under these and in support, in support of these three verses. So we kind of need to get a good grasp of them. Um, now, let me tell you, there's so much doctrinal truth in these first three verses. We could spend a night on pretty much the whole thing, <laughs> you know, each one of the phrases, but we don't have that kind of time. So we're just going to skim over the top of it and see what it says here. So you just read this to yourself. This is a mouthful. Um, and uh, so we're just going to scrape over the top of the surface just a little bit, but I hope you'll grasp what he's trying to say here. And so uh, we'll go through it. And the first thing he says here is long ago. Now, this is a time orienting phrase here that reminds us to understand the importance of the setting of the whole of the gospel. It is just not something that started in 30 AD when Jesus stepped out of a carpenter's shop. The gospel did not even start in 1 AD when Jesus, when Mary and Joseph showed up at the end to give birth to Jesus. That's not the beginning of the gospel either. The writer of Hebrews here sets for us the gospel message and the work of Christ within the context of the creation story and the covenants of the Old Testament. Long ago, he says, another way to say this would be in the beginning. That the very first words here of this letter remind us of the crucial nature of the work of God through Christ at the beginning of all Things. And so we cannot ignore the sacred words of God from both testaments and think we have the whole of the message of God. And that's the point Hebrews is making right here at the very beginning. The redemptive work of God is a tapestry woven from the Garden of Eden all the way to the New Jerusalem. And it is the center story of history of the earth from long ago in the garden to now to all the way to the last day of the earth. So long ago, first thing he says, then he says, and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So obvious if you read the Old Testament, knowing the stories that God spoke in many times in many ways, like uh, through to through a burning bush and through a fire on Mount Carmel and a whisper to Elijah. And he uh, spoke through a fish that swallowed Jonah. He spoke a lot of ways and he spoke, he spoke also in, in, in symbols. He spoke in stories, in visions, through poetry, through proverbs. And he spoke specifically here, he says, through the prophets and this is also, when he says, our fathers by the prophets, this is where we know that uh, the writer and his audience are Hebrew in background. He includes himself in this conversation here when he says, our fathers. And the fathers were, of course, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and on and on and on we go. God is speaking. These are not words of mere men. This is God who is speaking through them. And then he says, but... But in these last days, so but tells us something else is happening, something different from speaking through the prophets. Now, and then he says, in these last days. Now, I have had more people ask me um, if we, I think we are living in the last days, especially since 2020. And I, I know what they mean. They mean, are we in the end times? Are we, is that close? What do you think? And I always say the same, th same thing when somebody asks me that is, yes. Yes, we're living in the last days, and, uh, but what the New Testament writers call the last days is not what most ed evangelical Christians think uh, last days mean. Because according to Scripture, the last days began at the coming of Christ and will continue until he returns, ever how long that is. Peter, Luke, James, Paul, and right here in the Hebrews, they all included their time when they were writing as last days. You see right here, in these last days, when he was alive all the way back, 70 AD. And uh, so, so um, what we need to do is get our theology straight. 
<laughs> last days don't start out there some time when an antichrist shows up. The last days are now, and if you look at what John says in one of his letters, is that antichrist is coming, that's that final one, but so now many antichrists have come, or in the past, they're already here. Therefore, we know that this is the last hour. That is, we're living in the last days. And so we need to stop putting so much attention on uh, trying to figure out who a final antichrist is and be more concerned about the ones that are here already, right? And how do we know who, the, who this antichrist, these antichrists are? John tells us that too. This is antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. And, you know, if you use that criteria for defining Antichrist, we know there's a lot of those people around right now, right? And so, and so, the, uh, so what we have to do is realize that Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews and others, considered last days when they were living. And so we ought to be living now and also consider our day last days and live the way the New Testament writers exhorted us to live. That is, Paul said one sentence, make the most of your days, for the days are evil. Right? Not just marking time out there saying, wait, I wonder when some apocalyptic thing is going to happen for me to start living the way the New Testament encourages us to do it. Live right now. Live right now that way. We are living in the last days. And it ought to affect how you live, how you think, and how you interact with others. And so back to Hebrews, he says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Okay, so what the writer does here is he says God spoke formerly through the prophets one way, all the way up into the birth of Christ, and, and now he's beginning to speak in a different way through his Son. Now, what this does not mean is that God spoke through only through some of the things that Jesus said. Now, of course, he spoke truth. We need to listen. We need to obey. We need to apply. But this is not saying Jesus was like all the other prophets in that he brought a message from God. God spoke, what it's saying here, in the sending of his son. The whole of the incarnation, his whole coming, is the message that God was speaking. Not just what he said while he was here, but he sent his son, and the coming of Christ is a declaration of God. And that's why it is not enough to say that Jesus is a great teacher or a good moral leader. It's not enough. You've missed the point of why he came, is that if that's all you believe. Because Jesus didn't just teach the truth. He is the truth. And that makes him so much more than the words in red in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He, um, he, you, can say, you cannot say that you follow Jesus without believing that he is the divine, authoritative, perfect Lord of all. We don't get to decide who Jesus is for ourselves. He has defined it for us in his word. And so if you wonder, well, who, do you, who is Jesus anyway? Well, the writer of Hebrews says, okay, I'll tell you. And what he says in the rest of these verses here, right at the beginning, is he gives us a seven-fold uh, introduction to the uniqueness of Christ. Each one of these whole lesson. We could just delve into them and never get to the bottom, but we don't have time for that. We're just going to touch on them briefly, so stay with me, and we're going to go right through them. The first one is Christ the heir, where he says, he, whom he appointed heir of all things. Now I'm going to give you some word origins back to the Greek or the Hebrew in the study, because I think knowing word origins really helps us with understanding the scripture, but don't let that intimidate you. If, if it, 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 you know, just hold on to what makes sense to you. You don't have to write them down, but you can if you want to, but make notes about what you think will help you. So here the word air, and I'm not even going to try that word, <laughs> it means one who takes possession of or dominion or authority. And, um, so what he does here in this is juxtapose Christ, the heir, to the prophets. And so they are workers in God's kingdom, and he is 
heir to God's kingdom. And there's a vast difference between relationship and authority between Jesus and the prophets. And so Colossians 1.15 tell us, tells us that he is firstborn over all creation. Now that doesn't mean he was created first. Firstborn refers to preeminence in rank. He's the top. He's the chief. And he is the owner, like Psalm 2.8 says, I will make the nations your heritage, that is Christ, and the ends of the earth your possession. There is nothing that Christ doesn't have authority over. So we have Christ the heir, then we have Christ the creator. That is through, through whom also he created the world. Now, a lot of times when we read the Genesis uh, chapter 1 and 2 uh, story of creation, we don't really think about Jesus being there. We usually think about that Father, the uh, Spirit hovering over the waters, but Jesus is really the one at work. The, uh, the uh, through here means it's dia, which is the means by which something is accomplished. And I mean, uh, the verse here, John 1 3, says, all things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now, that's pretty comprehensive, right? All things came into being, nothing came into being without him. And so when we can read a verse like that, but what he Hebrews says in, in, in that phrase before is that it kind of goes beyond just how we normally think about creation, because the word for world is aeon which is where we get the word eon in our English language, which means the ages. So not only was Jesus the creator of rocks and trees and sky and uh, planets and stars and all of that stuff, Jesus has also created the fabric upon which all those things are written. That is including time and space. Everything was created by him. Then we're told that Christ is the reveal, re revealer. He is the re radiance of God, the glory of God. Now, the word radiance is apagasma, which is literally off flashing or shining forth. And the best analogy for that is the sun and its beams. So uh, the beams aren't something different from the sun, but they are the way we experience the sun, right? I mean, the sun would be amazing even if we couldn't, uh, with, even, even without the visible rays, you think about dark matter or a black hole, that's a powerful thing that scientists tell us and we can, you know, all about it. And, but it's really hard to appreciate a black hole, like stand it, look at blank space and go, wow, that's amazing, right? It's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, you can tell me it is by math and stuff, but it's hard to appreciate that. But, uh, you know, um, the sun by itself is impressive. We don't need to go to classroom to find out the sun's amazing. You just walk outside and feel the warmth on your face on a cold fall day or winter day. Or uh, you see the results of bursts of energy, like a lot of us saw the, the um, aurora borealis all the way down into Georgia back in the spring. That was amazing too. That is the impact of the rays of the sun. We see and we understand. So the writer here is telling us that Jesus is similar to the beams of the sun. He is how we experience and understand who God is. And then we have Christ the image. He is the exact imprint of his nature. That is God's nature. And imprint here is terrazzo, which was used by engravers in the minting of coins. And so uh, the impression or mark that was done by the one who was uh, striking coins here, you'd have that little engraving there, and then you press it into the metal, and it has an exact representation of what was on the, the mint there, uh, or the, the image there. That's what we see here with Jesus, right? What did he say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? And that he is the exact representation of the Father's attributes here on earth to us. One with the Father in essence. And the, so the Son is such a revelation of the Father that when we see Him, we see what God's real being is like. So then Christ the sustainer. So we have, have uh, Christ 
being uh, coming, he not only just is the creator up here, he is the sustainer down here, upholding the universe by the word of his power. So he isn't just creator out there, just started it all and just got it going. He is active in sustaining what he has created. Colossians 1.17 says he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, how are things held together? By the word of his power. Now, uh, this is like big things he holds together, like out there in the universe, stars and, and solar systems and all that kind of stuff, down to the tiniest little molecules. But he also sustains more than that. He sustains you and me every day. And he keeps us going when you don't have anything else to go from, right? That's the sustaining power of Christ and the Holy Spirit living in us. And we talk about, could talk about that for a long time. But remember that Christ's sustaining power is active and present all times, even when we don't notice it. Then, Christ the Redeemer. So we have Christ the Creator. He's out there. We think Creator. That's a long time ago. He's above all things creating. Then we have Sustainer. He's kind of coming a little bit closer to us, right? And now we have intimate, personal God, right? Christ the sin bearer is what he tells us he is. And the tense of this verb here means a once and for all completed action. And we're going to get to, to this way more as we move on, especially in chapter 7 and 9, where it goes into great length to explain how Christ's sacrifice is once and for all and how it made everything in the Old Testament as far as these sacrifices um, obsolete. That's the word that he used there. And so we're going to pack that more then. So I'll just leave that for now. But just for now, we see that Jesus is identified as the one who did the purifying. He didn't send anybody to do it. He also didn't give us any more rituals to do like they did in the Old Testament. He came and he died for us individually, personally. He's very close to us. And then the last one, we see him. So he's... He had come step by step closer to us from heir to creator to redeemer. And now here at the end, the last thing that the, the, the writer gives us is that he's returned to his exalted position as Christ, the ruler over all things where he is now and forever will be elevated, worshipped, glorified by all creatures, cre creatures under heaven and earth. And that all goes together to just tell us Christ is the supreme. Uh, just simply, and that's going to launch us to those three verses. There's so much in there. It's going to launch us into the re rest of the book in chapter four. I mean, sorry, verse four next week as we're going to cover the rest of chapter one. But we're going to stop there without, but not without application. So I'm going to go all the way back to the premise for this study that Jesus is greater than. That symbol right there. And so here at the beginning, I want you to start thinking about what is it that you tr that Jesus is on this side that and everything else is over there, but what is it in your life that you try to supplant Jesus with by moving it over here and moving him over there? What have you tried to put over here and tried to move him off of his rightful place? Now, we could list a lot of things. We could talk about work and relationships and, and hobbies and all kinds of sins. But uh, let me tell you what you mostly try to put here. You and me. <laughs> That's what we're always trying to do, right? We really try to very hard to supplant Christ with ourselves and our desires, our hopes, our dreams, our view of how things ought to be. Jesus, yes, I trust you to save me, trust you to take me to heaven way out there somewhere, but the rest of the time, well, I'll just handle that. Because the truth is, I want what I want, right? We're all there. We want what we want. And we sometimes we don't trust Jesus because we know that what he wants isn't often what we want. And he asks us to submit and to sacrifice and to lay down and give up and elevate him. We don't want to do that. I want to control my own life, and I want the outcome that I want. Let me tell you how you know if that's the truth. That you get mad at God when things don't turn out the way you want them to. Now, you might not say it out loud, 
We kind of fold our arms, kind of turn our back a little bit, and in our heart, we get upset with him. We kind of carry that anger inside of us, and we don't even want to admit to it. He says, lay things down, and we say no. We say, oh yeah, you can have my soul, God, but not my finances, not that relationship. Not, I'm not going to give up to your authority. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let go of generational hurt to walk in the fullness because you know what they did to me. I have a right to be angry. I'm not going to give up my right to assess the world the way I want to see it. And um, that's us really trying to supplant Jesus' rightful place in our lives. Over here, we don't want to be over there. We don't want him to be greater than. And self just kind of slide, tries to slide over here. And it doesn't really work because let me tell you, he doesn't move. No matter how we try, no matter how much we argue with him, he does not move. He is the supreme in every single thing. And no matter how much you try to put whatever it is over there that you want to put over there, he doesn't move. And it's only when we stop the struggle for who is here, then that's when we start finding the peace and the joy and the rest and the strength to stand no matter what happens to us when we acknowledge He is the Supreme. God is greater than. Jesus is greater than. Always, only, forever and ever. Amen? All right, God, we just thank you that you don't move. Because what a mess we would make up things if you did. And most of us have tried enough times to know that we can make a mess of it by fighting you for your rightful place. And God, I just pray as we begin this wonderful study in understanding who you really are and how there's no competition with you at all, even though we try to make it sometime. As we begin to understand this, God, open our eyes to places where we need to yield and surrender. Give us eyes to see. Help us see better. And then offer up to you whatever you ask us to give up. And we pray in your mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen.